Hello everyone, my name is Melissa Kay and I'm an instructor in Occupational Therapy 236 and 536 OT with Youth. This series of videos will cover the sensory and cranial nerve competency tests that you'll be performing later in the semester. This is actually a series of eight videos. Uh, this one, which is an introduction, and will give you some basic information. Six actual test videos, and then a final video that will focus on wrap-up, delivering results to clients, and anything else that you might need to do at the end of the testing. For the competency, you will actually be performing just one of the tests, but it's important that you learn all of them so that your knowledge base is complete. Typically, we would perform these tests with anyone who's had a neurological uh, condition or insult. Folks that have had a traumatic brain injury, um, a cere a cerebral vascular accident or CVA, otherwise known as a stroke, or other neurological condition. We might also perform these on someone who has lost sensation in their arms or hands to see what the extent of the issue is so that we can better address um, therapy with them. We, uh, in the course of doing these tests, may, if we're out in the field, perform other kinds of uh, fine motor tests as well as temperature sensitivity tests. But for our purposes, we're going to skip those for now. The tests would likely be performed one after the other from start to finish, but we're gonna break these up for the purposes of training you on the tests. The tests are as follows, light touch, pressure touch, and those two will be a similar setup, so we'll do them in the same video. Then, sharp dull, which is also called superficial pain, stereoagnosis, proprioception of the arm and the hand, and those will also be two different tests, but the video will be the same. And then, two tests that look at cranial nerve function. The first is about the muscles of the eye, so it's cranial nerves three, four, and six and then the cranial nerve five, which is the trigeminal nerve. So before testing, we wanna do several things. And in fact, let me give you the, the rundown of how you would perform these tests, and then I'll go back and describe the preparatory steps. First, you would set up for the client. Second, you would meet the client. Third, you would actually perform the testing. Fourth, you would document what you found and fifth, you would relay the results. So let's look at these one at a time. We start off by setting up for the tests. You always want to set up on a clean surface and clean that surface so you're sure that it's clean. You wanna have paper towel or another, uh, another product for the, the desktop or tabletop so that everything that you're setting out in terms of your materials, you're sure are clean and hygienic. You want to have a chair that's comfortable height and, uh, and co configuration for your client. You want all supplies set up and within easy reach, but not out there so that they're distracting the client. And you want to have enough room around your table and chairs so that you can push back from the table, you can move around to um, be in a better position to work with your client, or you can reposition your client somewhat so that the testing can be more comfortable and also more ergonomic. So that's the first thing. It's often overlooked when students do the comp and are testing because they uh, get very nervous and that's totally natural. But if you can remember the steps and be methodical about it, you will um, ultimately be more effective. The second point is meeting the client. So when the client comes in, you'll greet them and you'll see how I do that when uh, we're demonstrating the tests. Then you'll introduce yourself and your role for the day and confirm the nature and the specifics of the condition. So for example, if somebody has a stroke, you might wanna say, so I understand that you're here to address some of the deficits or challenges that you've uh, experienced due to your stroke, and I understand that your stroke is affecting your right side, 
right? So nothing worse than um, thinking that somebody has a left side that is impaired and that's actually the right. So do confirm that. Make sure the client is comfortable and you'll be asking about that obviously and discreetly. Explain each of the tests before you perform it and I'll be going through that with you. You don't need to use my words, but I'll give you a, uh, an outline, so to speak. And then you'll really want to use plain language when you're explaining the test, doing the test, and relaying the results. So for example, uh, there's a couple uh, terms that we use in sensory testing that we as OTs know, but our clients may not. One of them is the word intact, as in your sense of light touch or your sense of superficial pain is intact. Clients may know what that means and that it's a good thing, but they may not. So the best thing to do is to say, your sense of light touch is intact, which means that everything is working just fine, right? So you can use the technical term. You don't want to ever dumb it down for clients, but you definitely want to explain any terms that may not be familiar. Other terms that you may want to explain are occluding vision, and we're going to be um, doing a number of the tests without the client being able to see what we're doing, right? Because they're testing for tactile or proprioception, and we don't want them uh, we, would, we don't want them responding to the test using their sense of vision. We really want to send to test their sense of touch. So occluding vision is another one. Proprioception is a term that you'll want to explain, as is stereoagnosis. So just some things to keep in mind. The third part of the process is actually testing the person. There'll be eight tests in six videos. So we'll do that once we get there. In general, however, you'll want to explain each test before you conduct it. You'll want to answer any questions that the client has about the test. You'll want to give the client a choice when you occlude their vision for either closing their eyes or using a folder. Now, some folks may feel vulnerable and not want to close their eyes. So we need to be aware of this and we need to actually provide them the choice to keep their eyes open. The two tests that we cannot do that are the proprioception test. And you'll see that I'm busy with both hands, so I can't use a file folder to, um, to block the client's vision. We want to maintain a respectful bedside or tableside manner, but we also need to get the tasks done and not be over solicitous or over empathizing or apologizing for what we're doing. So this can be difficult to uh, kind of uh, frame the professional relationship because we do empathize with our clients, but we want to do so in a way that's not going to interfere with us effectively performing the tests, which will then inform their care. So actually being a good thing ultimately. Another thing that comes up, and it comes up for me, and hopefully I'll be able to model this for you, is that you will make mistakes. We forget things, there's a lot of detail. That's okay, everybody's gonna make mistakes. You and me and the therapist that has been working with folks with traumatic brain injury for 30 years. What do you do if you make a mistake? You simply go back and you redo the aspects of the test that you messed up. Uh, there's not a need to confess that you messed up to your client. That's actually gonna kind of break down their trust and rapport a little bit typically. So you don't need to go back. You just need to say, we're gonna redo this part. And uh, you don't need to apologize to the client. So um, take a deep breath, redo the part of the test, move along once you've gotten effective results. The fourth part of the process is documentation. Now your documentation, even though we've provided you with formal sheets to use and write down your results, are typically not gonna go in that client's permanent chart. So the, uh, the documentation is for your, uh, for your knowledge and for your memory, and then you'll likely transfer the results to an electronic chart. So the most important thing is that you understand what your shorthand is. We use, uh, a number of symbols, a plus to indicate that um, a sensation is totally intact, 
and if it's appropriate that the client is able to localize it. A minus, meaning either that um, they haven't localized it or with the sharp dull that they can't differentiate sharp and dull. And a zero, meaning that they didn't feel any sensation. So you use those in a way that makes sense for you um, and develop a system that suits you. Some therapists record the findings after they've done an entire test. Some therapists record the findings after doing a few of the stimuli and then they take a couple seconds to record. You pick what's good for you. I do recommend, however, that you don't record your results after every stimuli. It just breaks up the flow of the testing. Also, you don't want your paperwork to overshadow you, the test, or your rapport with the client. So it's best to keep it off to the side and to be pretty low key about it. You can tell the client, I'm just gonna be keeping track of some of the results so that when I um, finalize the results, I can report back to you and the team effectively. The last part is relaying the results to the client and cleaning up. So we'll go into this in a separate video, but typically you would review the results with your client after doing all of the tests. When you do your competency, however, you're gonna relay the results of the tests that you do in your competency after you're all done. Then you're going to clean up your, your um, space and make sure that you dispose of everything safely. If you can, you want to keep your workspace and your materials clean and tidy and moving along during the test, but if that's not possible for you, it's totally fine to do that afterwards. Okay, so that was a lot of information. Uh, we are going to now go through it one test at a time, and then as I said, at the end of this series of videos, we'll go through relaying the results. Thanks so much for listening and I'll look forward to seeing you in the next video.